last time. I think the one we left off on last time. And I want to take a look at something. define a word and as we define the word I want to talk about a new concept that we're going to get into so let's see last week we did fun with dates and on Monday we did this All right, we had these different pet classes. All right, and to look at a couple of them, we had to find a pet as an abstract class. And we define then a dog and a lap dog. And then we defined a cat. I think that was all of our classes. Did we have another one? Yeah, we had a house cat. All right. <clears throat> Pet was an abstract class. What does that mean? That means we cannot create an instance of it. All right. Even though there's a constructor on it, we can't directly call the constructor on the pet class. That's what an abstract class means. So if we go and edit this, I cannot say pet p equals new pet. We get an error if we try to compile that. Why do we get an error? We get an error because pet is an abstract class and you cannot create an instance of an abstract class. In other words, here we're saying we have a pointer that's going to hold a pet, put, it in, put in it an instance of the object pet. Can't create an instance of the object, instance of the object pet. So therefore, if we go and compile this, boom, we get A million errors. Why do we get a million errors? Oh. I'm in the wrong folder. All right, we get one error. <laughs> Good. One error is better than a million errors. And what does it say? It says, pet is abstract, cannot be instantiated. One of the rare cases where the error message is really straightforward. What does instantiate mean? It means create a new instance by saying new and then calling the constructor. So that's not allowed. This, however, is allowed.
pet p equals new house cat sprinkles comma seven. That's allowed because we're not creating a new instance of a pet. We're creating a new instance of a house cat, right? New house cat. We are storing a reference to that house cat in a pointer called p that can hold pointers to any kind of pet that we have. All right? So if I say dog d equals new dog, I'm creating a dog and I'm putting it in a pointer that is meant to hold dogs. That's allowable. I can put the pointer to that object in a variable of type dog because that's what that object is, a dog. I can create a new lap dog and put it in a container, uh, in a pointer called lap dog, right? Because that's a lap dog. I can actually even do this. Why? Because I can create my lap dog. I can point to a lap dog with a pointer that is meant to hold dogs because a lap dog is a dog. And we went over this last time. This side determines what version of the function we get. This side determines what methods are available. All right. So in this case, if I create a pet called P, which is a new house cat, or rather if I create a new house cat and put it in a pointer called pet, when I call the appropriate methods, I'm going to get the house cat's methods. However, I can only call the methods that were defined in pet. All right? And we more or less prove that here, all right, with this. Because I put in my array list of pets different kinds of pets. I put a dog, I put a lap dog, and I put a house cat in there. I'm going to get rid of this temporarily. This is going to give us an error because catch frisbee is a method that only exists on a dog level. And what these are is these are pets. And pets don't have a catch frisbee method, therefore I get an error. Because remember, what's on this side of the equal sign determines which functions we're allowed to call. What is over on the other side of the equal sign determines what version of the function we get. All right. So if I say make sound, I'm going to get the dog version, the lap dog version, and the house cat version. But if I say get food, I'm going to get the dog version, the lap dog version, the house cat version. Because that side determines what version of the function we get. If, however, I say catch frisbee, I'm going to get a compile error. Because not all pets have a catch frisbee method. And What's on this side of the equal sign determines what functions are available. Only functions declared on the pet class and any of its superclasses are available. So to sort of prove that, let's go in and compile it. And sure enough, we get an error. Kind of a vague error. What essentially that's telling us is there's nothing on a pet called catch frisbee. Only certain kinds of pets have the, pet, the catch frisbee method. Now, if we get rid of that, we should be OK. So spot says, by wow. We got the dog version of make a sound. And we got the dog version of the get food. We get the lap dog version of make sound. And we get the lap dog version of get food, which happens to be the same as the dog version of get food. Finally, for the cat, we get the cat version of make, make sound. And we get the cat version of get food. 
Another way to say this is that a pet can take many forms. All right? A pet can take many forms. It can take the form of a regular dog, of a lap dog, of a house cat. All right? And each of those forms can have its own form of any of the methods that are available on pet. All right? So the dog has its own form of the, or own version or form of the make sound method. So does a cat. So does a house cat. So does a lap dog. And if we made rabbits and mice and all that, they could all have their own version of these methods. All right. So pet takes many forms, and each of the form can have its own version of the methods. That's what comes down to the new word that we're going to define, which is polymorphism. What's poly mean? Multiple, more than one, many. What's morphism mean? Morph. Morph means to change, that's true. Like if you talk about in an animation package, you might have a morph uh, uh, capability. So it's changing, but it's changing something specific. It's changing usually the shape or the form of something. So if you have like a circular blob and you want to make it in a square blob, the more functionality changes the form of it so that it goes from one to another. So you could even, like there's body types. Ectomorphic, I think means skinny, means thin. All right. Endomorphic means, I think, heavier. And so on down the line. So morph means forms. So polymorphism means that Classes can take, depending on how they're set up, classes can take many forms. And the functions can take many forms. In this case, as you can see here, we have an array list that's going to hold pets. We create our three different kinds of pets. We run, <coughs> or we add rather, each of those pets to the array list. We loop through the array list and call the exact same functions on each of the entries in that array list. But we get very different results. Why do we get different results? Because pets can take many forms. And each form can have its own version or form of the function. All right. So that's what polymorphism is. So this is a pretty simple, straightforward example of polymorphism. All right? That is actually one of the advantages of inheritance. There's two advantages of inheritance. One of the advantages is that you can share code between classes. In other words, I define a pet class, and I define the set and gets for these methods. I don't have to code those on the dog or the lap dog unless I want to override it. All right? So one of the advantages of inheritance is that you can share code between subclasses. You only have to code the differences between the subclass and the superclass. So like in this case, if I would be look between pet and dog, well, the dog has a different make sound method, or the dog has a make sound and get food method, which I have to declare because they're declared as abstract here. And a dog has an extra method, the get frisbee method. The lap dog is the same as a dog, except it makes a different sound. Now, again, remember the catch constructors don't work here, uh, constructors don't come into play with inheritance. All right? So two advantages of inheritance. You inherit code, so you only have to put certain code in one place, and then all the subclasses get it. 
unless you need to override it. The second advantage is that you can apply polymorphism. So I can put as many different kinds of pets in this array list and process them all the same. Call the same functions, do anything I want to with any function that's declared on the pet level. And regardless of what kind of pet it is, I'll get the appropriate form of that method. All right? So I'll get the dogs make sound, I'll get the lap dogs make sound, I'll get the cats make sound, and so on. If there was it for rabbit or parakeets or whatever, all right, we're going to get the, the right form of that function. And so the pet, the get sound method for a pet takes many different forms. And if we have the right thing in there, uh, and when, when we create a class, we get the right form for the, the class that we created. So that's the two advantages of inheritance. All right. One is that you inherit code only write what's different. We can reuse the code of the superclass. And the number two advantage is polymorphism. OK. So now, you might have the idea, as people that write programming languages do, to say, if inheritance is good, is it possible for something to inherit from multiple different classes to have two parent classes. Right now in all our examples, we have, whenever we have inheritance, lab dog extends dog, all right? And dog extends pet. And pet doesn't extend anything, all right, except the basic object form. But if you notice, each class House cat extends cat. Cat extends pet. So far, we've only had one parent class per class. Now, you could go up, and there can be multiple ancestors, but there's only one class that a class can directly inherit from. So our diagram for the pet example would look something like this. Pet dog lap dog cat and house cat. Each class on there only has one parent class. Now, that class could have its own parent class and so on, so we can have a chain going up. So there's multiple super classes from that perspective, but each class could only have one class directly above it. All right? Would it be possible to do it differently? Would it be possible for there to be multiple inheritance? Well, Let's talk about that, all right? Something could be two different things for sure, right? We're aware of that, you know? I might be a, for example, a professor and a coach, right? And a father, all right? So I full, fulfill three roles, right? So if we were developing a system, could you develop a system where you had something like this. Coach, professor, and like coach professor? I don't know what we would call that. 
Let me think of another example that might be a little bit goofy, but it's true. Birds. Birds are animals. Does it pass the is a test? Bird is an animal, or bird is a kind of animal. Yeah, so that's valid. What about flying thing? Flying thing, all right? Yeah. A bird is a flying thing. We'll just call them flyers for short, because flying thing sounds awkward. A bird's a flyer, all right? Um, a bird is a kind of flying thing, or a bird is a kind of flyer. Yeah, that makes sense. Can we have multiple inheritance, though? And the answer is we could, but it makes stuff very complicated for a number of reasons. What if these two things have the same function? Get name. Which one would the bird inherit? Would the bird get the get name from this method or from this method? What if there were attributes that a bird that that that, that animals and flying things had in common? It would be very confusing to know how things worked. All right. Also with constructors. Remember we said that in a constructor, before you can create one of these, you have to call a constructor on this. And before you create a constructor on this, you have to call the constructor on this. So there's a clear chain. This guy's going to call that guy's constructor. This guy's going to call that guy's constructor. Just write up the list. How would that work here? You probably would, but Java took the easy way out on this. Java took the, you probably could figure out a way, because I know there's languages that support multiple inheritance. So they figured out how to do it somehow. But that sort of complicates everything. So what Java said is, OK, only inherit from one class. No such thing as multiple inheritance. All right? Well, OK. You know, that's, uh, that's OK, but that sort of, maybe we've lost a little bit of an opportunity there. All right? And sort of the compromise that Java has is they say, OK, we're not going to have multiple inheritance because that's way too complicated. What we're going to do instead is have something called an interface. And a class can only inherit from one class. And class inherits or extends another class. But a class can implement, that's the word, not inherit, but implement, as many interfaces as you want. All right? So generally speaking, what you do is you think of which one seems to be the stronger is a relationship. And look and say, well, a bird's an animal, and oh yeah, a bird also flies. Well, probably animal is a better description of a bird than just a flying thing. You know, because animals are going to have more things in common than flying things. If you think of flying things, what, do all, what are some things that all flying things have in common? W well, wings, maybe. Uh, a, a velocity uh, that they fly. A, uh, a maximum height, maybe. I don't know. Whereas animals will have a whole bunch of things in common. So you pick the stronger is a relationship, and that's the one you inherit. And everything else, you make an interface. Okay. Now, this, sounds, this might sound a little confusing, 
without an example. So I'll pull up an example here in a minute. But the idea is this. Remember the two advantages that you get for inheritance? Inherit code, you only write in once and you only write what's different in the subclasses and you can reuse code. We don't get that with, with interfaces. All right, That is only an advantage of inheritance. But polymorphism is also an advantage of interfaces and inheritance. All right, So this one is inheritance only. This one is interface and inheritance. So let's look at an example of an interface. A, a quick and dirty description of an interface is an interface is like a class that is abstract and only contains abstract methods. Okay. I didn't want to close that. Oh well. We'll look at that. We'll look at these and then we'll run it and we'll um, play around with it. All right, I've created a interface and I've created two classes that implement that interface. The interface is has seats. Okay? Has seats. Public interface has seats. Remember, an interface is like a abstract class. And therefore, I can't instantiate something that has seats. In addition, the two methods are by definition abstract, because methods in a interface are abstract. So let's say I want to keep track of capacities of things. Let's say on a college, has seats. All right. What are things on a college campus that have seats? Things that are different that have seats? Well, an auditorium would be one. Auditoriums have seats. Classrooms have seats. Labs have seats. Those are all rooms, right? Do buses have seats? Absolutely. There might be a bus that we could take on a field trip, all right? And we might want to know, gee, can this class fit in the van or the bus that we have, all right? If we use our imagination, we could probably think of a lot more of things that have seats. Bicycles have seats, all right? Um, vans, automobiles, vehicles. Uh, dentist offices have seats, all right? I'm trying to think of as wildly different things as I can think of. 
to show you that it would really be a stretch to try to create an inheritance structure that accommodated all those things, right? An automobile and bicycle and motorcycle and all that are kinds of vehicles. So that's probably what we would inherit from. An auditorium and an office and a classroom and a lab are kinds of rooms, all right? So that's what we would inherit them from. But they all contain the fact that they all have seats. And we might have want to treat them the same, all right? Might want to treat them the same as everything else that has seats for certain bits of functionality. For example, if we wanted to schedule a class in some place that had seats, whether it be a lab, an auditorium, or a bus, we would want to check to make sure can that class fit in this thing that has seats. So we define only the names of the functions and what they return and what arguments they take. So, has seats only returns an integer. We don't define the specifics of the function. This is an abstract function. All we are saying is that anything that implements this interface needs to have a method to determine and to display how many seats there are in that thing. Whether it be a bus, a lab, an auditorium. Secondly, there is a method for will this number of people fit in this place, all right? In other words, I have 20 people. Will they fit in this bus? I have 18 people. Will it fit in this lab? And so on. So I've defined this public interface. I then implement the interface for whatever I need to. And in this case, I did an auditorium, and I did a room. Now, notice that I don't say it extends like I do with inheritance, I say implements. And again, a interface or a class can implement multiple interfaces, unlike extends. A class can extend another class and implement other interfaces, too. So in this case, I have an auditorium. Where did it go? Oh, here it is. The has seat interface doesn't have any attributes in it. In object-oriented terms, it's not its business how each of the things that inter, uh, uh, um, implements it comes up with this function. It just has to have this function. A lot of times you'll read, like in the book, it will say that an interface is a contract, that any class that implements it will have these functions. But the details of the function can be very, very, very different. Let's look, for example, and compare the auditorium and the room. The auditorium has an attribute of the capacity. And we can set that in a constructor. We can get and set it. And when there's the get how many seats method, we can return the capacity. All right. So whatever the capacity is, maybe it's a 500-seat auditorium or a 200-seat auditorium or whatever, that will be returned by the get how many seats method. The Boolean, will it fit? Well, if the capacity is greater than the argument, then it will fit. So if this is a 100-seat auditorium and 75 people are trying to fit into it, yeah, it will fit. Otherwise, it won't fit. Now, let's look at the room class. The room class doesn't have a capacity. All right? 
the room class has a type. All right. In other words, we're going to specify for this room what type of room it is. Is it an office? Is it a lab? Is it a classroom? Or is it a lecture hall? Get how many seats for a room looks very different than get how many seats for an auditorium. Right? That's the polymorphism aspect of it. It can take many shapes, many forms. For an auditorium, you have a capacity. and That's how many people can fit into it. For a room, we have to ask what kind of room it is. If it's an office, three people can fit into it. If it is a classroom, 24 people can fit into it. If it's a lab, 24 people can fit into it. And finally, if it's a lecture hall, 100 pe uh, people can fit into it. So we can return that. Finally, we have a Boolean for fits, and the function is about the same. If how many seats is greater than or equal to arg, then they could fit, otherwise they don't fit. Now, I'm going to make a change real quick here, because there's a mistake in this example. Can anyone spot the mistake in this example? Yes. Should be dot equals. You do not compare strings with the with the double equal. That only works for primitive. If I'm a more, you know, when I become even more experienced of a professor, I'll claim that I made those mistakes on purpose to see if you were paying attention. But I have a feeling this is just a mistake. OK. Now let's look at my test class. My test class, I create a room and an auditorium, an array list of has seats objects. So I could use an interface here. All right, I can say that whatever I put in this array list has to implement the has seat interface. What does that mean? That means I am guaranteed to have all of the methods that are described in the has seats interface. So I can, for each of these, display how many seats are available in them. If I define an auditorium as having 100, or a room as having, or as being an office. When I add it through there, I can ask for each of them, tell me how many seats are in it. So let's go and compile this, make sure that it works, and we'll talk some more about it. And sure enough, a, the office has three, the auditorium has 100, which is reset the capacity of. OK, so let's review some things that you can't do, that you're not allowed to do. Number one, I cannot put any attributes in an interface. I'll just try to put something in here, in x equals 0. didn't care about it. Did I not save it? I did. Well, I guess I can. I don't think it's going to do anything with it, though. That, that was surprising. Can I put any code in a method?
that I can't do. All right? Because every method inside an interface is assumed to be an abstract method. So an abstract method means that there are no actual instructions in it. All right? Couldn't do it to that one either. I'm really surprised I could put an attribute in there. I'll bet I can do that, but I can't use that attribute for anything, so it's kind of a waste. I'll bet. Yeah, but, but this is an abstract me uh, object, so I can't. Normally with an abstract method, there's no or abstract object, there's no, there's no, uh, um, there's no attributes. Now, as far as implementing, well, no, an abstract class can have attributes. I'm intrigued by this. Can I? Can I use that? I'll be darned. Learn something new every day. You can declare a you can declare a attribute in an interface. I did not think that you could. All right. At any rate, if I declare something implements that interface, I am I've made a contract to say that these functions have to exist in it. Because they're abstract functions in here, I have to implement them in anything that implements that interface. So if I do not have a method called get how many seats, I will get an error. And it says that auditorium is not abstract and does not override get how many seats. In other words, I have promised that this class implements that interface, which is saying that this class contains these two functions. And if I don't supply one of those functions, then I get an error. If I even change the function to include an argument, then I also am going to get a compile error because I have not implemented the precise method defined in the interface. So remember, when we define an interface, we define abstract methods. When we define a method, we define the name of the method, what it returns, and what the arguments are. So if, if that doesn't match what is declared in the interface, then it's as though that method was not defined and I get an error. Make sure everything is clean. So now, notice that here, where we create our rooms, create our auditorium, create our array list, add things to it, and then loop through, we get the different form of the get how many seats method for the different form of has seats 
objects that we've created. So depending on whether we've created a room or an auditorium, we get the proper version of that function. Another thing I'm not allowed to do is I'm not allowed to create an object of the type interface. I can't create an instance of an interface. Therefore, there's no constructors on interfaces. Now, is this legal? Is that a legal statement? It actually is. That might not be obvious at first. Let's compile it and make sure. I'm not lying here. It compiles. What is this saying? This is saying I have a pointer that is going to point to any object that implements the has seat interface. So anything that implements that interface, I can point to it with this pointer. On the other side, I say create a new auditorium object with a capacity of 100 seats. Okay. When I do that, it creates an auditorium object. It does not create a has seats object. Remember, I can instantiate an interface. So I can't instantiate a has seats object. But I can instantiate an auditorium object and point to it with a pointer that points to anything that implements the has seats interface. So that actually is legal. Just like it was legal to put anything that implements the has seat interface in an array list of has seats. Questions about this. This is one of those things that for now, just try to memorize the rules. It will take a few examples, it will take a little bit of time for the purpose and really the power of this to sort of sink in. All right. Uh, all right, that's all for today. We'll see you up in lab.